Um, it's great to see some of you uh, joining us from the previous webinars that we've run in this series. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Katharina Ullman. I work with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, and I'm also a partner of the Integrated Crop Pollination Project. One person who's missing on this panel today is John Skinner. He'll hopefully join us before the end of the hour, but um, usually he's, he's joining us too from the University of Tennessee. Um, he, along with the Bee Health uh, eExtension.org site, has been uh, hosting this webinar series titled Ensuring Crop Pollination in U.S. Specialty Crops. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Shelby Fleischer in a few minutes and the presentation that he's going to be giving on pumpkin pollination, but I just want to remind everyone that there is going to be one last uh, webinar in this series taking place next week, next Tuesday, March 28th, focused on uh, blue orchard bees and uh, their use in almond crop pollination. For those of you that missed uh, previous webinars in this series, I'm going to put a YouTube link in the chat box. Um, if you click on that link, that's the Bee Health YouTube link. And you can find uh, um, uh, the previous webinars uh, by uh, clicking on that link. Um, so without further ado, I'm really excited uh, to uh, be able to have Shelby Fleischer here to present on pumpkin pollinators and pollination. Shelby is a professor in the Department of Entomology at Penn State University and has over 25 years of experience in research and extension for vegetable cropping systems. Um, and he works both on integrated pest management and pollination. Um, he is going to be taking at least one break in the presentation to answer questions. And then uh, we'll also have uh, probably about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the um, presentation for you to all to ask additional questions. One other reminder is there are CCA credits available, certified crop advisor credits available for this webinar series. I'll post the link uh, that you'll need to fill out um, to the form that you'll need to fill out to get those credits at the uh, end of the webinar. As we're transitioning over to Shelby's slides to begin the presentation, Mark is going to launch another quick poll um, uh, so we can get a sense of where everyone is from. Hopefully all regions are represented. Um, it's been great to see the diversity of countries represented and the diversity of um, people representing different stakeholders within pollination from growers to um, researchers to extension agents to um, uh, uh, pollination specialists and beekeepers. Um, so we thank you all for uh, taking the time to, to share a little bit about yourselves through this poll. And um, without further ado, I think uh, the poll will be wrapping up after a few more seconds for people to fill it out. And while that's happening, um, I'll pass it on to Shelby to start sharing his screen. Okay. Um. I've gotten a little preview of this presentation and it's it's great it's got some great videos in it so it'll be great to uh, to get everyone's uh, questions and uh, feedback at the end okay uh, I think uh, can everyone see the screen now with my slide so Shelby we're gonna need you to swap um, so if you go up to display settings in the, the top upper left hand corner I've got, yes. So right there, and then do swap, go ahead and click that, and then do swap presenter in view. Okay. And if this doesn't work for you now, now we can see your, sli your slides, and then you should be able to see the notes, I think, on your other screen. Okay. Is that okay. gonna work for you? That's working for me. Okay, yeah. good. Great. Let me know if it's any problem on the other end. Um, thank you for those introductions. I'm, uh, I'm Shelby Fleischer from Penn State. Um, and I will say that most of my work comes from the IPM, the pest management side, and so I have a little more effort there over the years. And anytime you deal with pest management, you're always considering beneficials in a system. In the last four or five years, I've been lucky enough to uh, pay attention to the pollinators in a lot more detail. Um, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So ensuring pumpkin pollination and conserving wild bees, it helps get the job done. <laughs> The, um, I 
first want to acknowledge that uh, I've been really grateful to be part of this team. This team is an uh, integrated crop pollinator project from a Specialty Crop Research Initiative Award, a NEFA Award. You can see there's a lot of uh, participants from all over the country, uh, many of whom have some expertise in working with cucurbits. Um, so we're defining integrated crop pollination as the use of managed and wild pollinator species in combination with management practices that support, augment, and protect pollinator populations to provide reliable and economic pollination. So you can see uh, the various components here, and I'll be emphasizing um, the, the wild bees here and some horticultural practices, and I'll get into some pesticide stewardship in this particular talk. So if we focus in on the plant, a few slides on the plant, I think many of you already know that pumpkin, uh, that whole genus, uh, cucurbita, has separate male and female flowers. You can uh, always see the male with the long stem here and um, the pollen is all on this structure up here. Uh, the nectary on this, on the, in the pollen is way down, way down here and um, there's slits right about in here where if a bee is going after the nectar, or he, she has to uh, manage to get her tongue parts down in there. The female part here, you've got the ovary, you've got the, um, the style here, the stigma, and it's an open trough here where the nectar is. And so as a bee approaches this, this those of you interested in this, uh, this is a great um, manuscript here. And, and it, you can see the path of the bee will typically land on a petal and try and work their way down to the nectary or here, work their way down to the nectary and has this spiral path and picks up a lot of pollen on its body. Now the ovule is receptive for just plus or minus a day of flowering and the flower only opens for a day for usually three to six hours depending on temperature, typically three or four hours in, in my part of the country during the middle of the summer. So we have to move that pollen and that pollen is extremely large among pollen types, very sticky, it's not wind dispersed, and it sticks to insect body hairs, as you can see it all over the uh, body of this, uh, in this case, a squash bee. Now the anthers will provide like, one estimate is 43,000 grains of pollen, and the fruit set requires about 1,500 to 2,000 grains. So if a bee picks this up and moves it, um, it looks like you can do it pretty quickly, but, when, for example, when a honeybee visited a pumpkin flower, and this was studied in this paper here, she removed on average 13,000, 14,000 grains from a male flower. And as she flew around, she retained about one to 4,000 grains. This graphic here shows you the number of grains per bee um, at seven in the morning, eight, nine, and 10. Um, so you can see this decline in, in in, in the uh, retention of the pollen on the body of the bee. Keep in mind, some bees will be grooming this pollen off. Some might be packing it into a corbicula to feed their offspring. So it's the pollen that's left over, the body hair pollen, that is available for transfer. And she effectively transferred about 50 to 230 grains each time she visited a flower. There's a wide range of estimates in the literature, but you can see we're gonna need multiple visits in this case, about 12 honey bee visits uh, per flower within that three to five hour time frame to get good fruit set, to get the uh, pollination to occur. So that's fruit set. We also have to consider fruit retention. Uh, the plant itself is influencing what the yield will be. So once a fruit is set, it establishes itself as a resource sink and it competes for nutrients and resources from the plant. Um, in the case of pumpkins, uh, depending on the horticultural practices and the, the heat and, and, and nutrition things, it's gonna influence how much of the fruit that is set is retained. Um, but in general, you can say that those fruit that are set with more pollen uh, are more likely to be retained. Um, and you can get several studies that show you can affect fruit weight. So here's a good example where the fruit weight is increasing with the number of viable seeds. Those are the ovules that were pollinated. And in some cases, we get increased yield. So there's a couple studies here from uh, groups in New York, Peterson, uh, art studies, 
uh, working with Brian Nault up in New York. And you can see the yield, in this case measured as kilograms per plant, is increasing as you get an increased visits per flower. And from here, it's in honeybees. From here, the data is from bumblebees. It's interesting we're getting a more rapid increase with bumblebees in this particular study. So we can influence fruit set, fruit retention, yield, weight. Um, not always. Actually, in Pennsylvania, we found that we could not influence, uh, we could not show an increase in yield measured as the number of fruit per unit area um, with increasing visitation rate. But that still gave us um, a lot of opportunity to influence economics. In this particular case, we're working with a grower that has um, multiple fields of 20 to 60 or 70 acres, uh, overall about 400 acres. And this grower used the information to reduce the stocking rate from, in his case, uh, um, one per acre. Oh, he, he was at one per two acres. He reduced it to one per acre. He was charged, he was paying at the time $135 per hive times 400 acres. This worked out to a savings of $20,000, $27,000 per year uh, for the last four years in a row. So kind of in summary for the plant part of this, moving right along, we have some studies that show more, be more bees are resulting in more pollination, resulting in more seeds and more yield. We have other studies suggesting we've got sufficient pollination going on, sufficient um, visitation rates, and that results in a, uh, the grower taking advantage of that and getting a reduced uh, stocking rate, which is a dollar savings for the grower. It's fairly significant dollar savings. Um, so in summary there, we can influence uh, fruit set, fruit retention, fruit weight, yield, or economics. Um, now, up till now, I've been talking about um, visitation of a wide range of bees. In fact, in Pennsylvania, we recorded 30 different bee species visiting um, our pumpkin uh, flowers in very commercial type settings. Um, but even though we had a, the, the species pool, the entire composition was fairly large, overwhelmingly, and this is occurring in multiple studies from uh, work in pumpkin, we're seeing that um, the majority of visits are coming from one of three species. Uh, in, the, in these particular graphs here, you see some data that we had from this ICP project where we've got, we've looked at thousands of flowers and thousands of visits. You can see Bombus, overwhelmingly in this case, it was Bombus impatiens, the common Eastern bumblebee, or honeybee, apis, or squash bee, pepinapis, was doing the majority of the visits. And you see the pattern in one particular year. Here's another pattern in a different year. If we look at different fields on different dates, we see some variation among which species, species was doing the most visits at any particular date. But in summary, if we can focus on these three species, these three here, honeybee, squash bee, and bumblebee, um, we're doing a real good job of conserving uh, getting the wild bees to, wild and managed bees, these are managed honeybees here, um, to achieve the pollination services in pumpkin. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm gonna move for uh, the next large chunk of this presentation. Um, I won't speak much about the honeybee, I'll speak mostly about the squash bee. There's two genera in uh, the United States, Pepinapis occupies much of the US. Um, in the south, maybe southeast, I think Xenoglossa is also present, acting as a squash bee. I'll be um, I'll be talking about Pepinapis. Uh, for the bumblebee, we saw seven species in Pennsylvania in, in, our, in our settings, and I've listed them here. But by the time we were looking at um, visitation rates in pumpkins through the last week of July, all through August, it was overwhelmingly Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee. So um, wild and free pollinators. Um, all I'll say about uh, honeybee, because uh, at the other talks will, the other presentations do a, a good job of discussing it, is uh, they can do the job. Um, here you see a great picture from Katharina Allman of honeybees. Notice they're all nectaring. They're all down uh, trying to get the nectar from the trough that's underneath uh, the stigma here. Um, 
you want to establish good contracts with beekeepers, make sure that you've got a good relationship, that all of this is written down. I think most of the commercial, like our commercial vegetable production guides gives you uh, example contracts to work with. Uh, move, move the hives out of the field when your fruit set is, is uh, completed. And uh, a lot of the things that we'll be talking about for protecting bees in general will also be protecting honeybees. If I, I'll spend a few minutes now talking about the squash bee, um, a bit about its life cycle. This picture also from Katharina, you can see it, uh, in this case, nectaring again. There's its proboscis going down into that trough to pull up nectar. Uh, this, is, this insect is a specialist on squash and pumpkin. Uh, in our area, it, it emerges in July, about the time that morning glory flowers open. That's when we first see the adults emerging. We go through maybe two to three weeks of a, of a time frame where uh, they're not nesting yet. This is a dispersal time. Um, they need to find squash and pumpkin. They need to find cucurbita as a host. Um, the females will establish nests five, ten, maybe ten, five to ten inches deep. Um, I'll show you some pictures of that with four to five cells per nest. And the larvae will feed uh, on squash and pumpkin pollen They'll overwinter as a pupae. Here's, here's a picture of, of this life cycle. This is also from Katharina. So we're dealing with a soil nesting bee. The adult here is, is collecting this pollen. Uh, she will, he, he and she will nectar on a few other plant species, but they're a specialist for the pollen itself to feed their offspring. They're special, they, have, they need cucurbita pollen. Uh, the female will dig a nest, which I'll, we'll look at a little closer later, and they'll create a cell here, and in this cell, they'll provision it with pumpkin pollen, uh, package it into this larval provisioning uh, food here, lay an egg, and then the egg will start hatch and develop into a larvae, and feed as a larvae, and continue feeding, consuming probably virtually all of this provision. This cell is capped off now while this is happening. It'll turn into a pre pupae and it'll sit in that life stage for the, almost the rest of the year. So we're talking about um, a relatively short period of time, a few weeks for any given cell, um, and the rest of the time it's totally underground. Univoltine, uh, one generation a year. Um, it superficially looks somewhat like a honeybee, but there are things that you can use to distinguish it. I'll give you a quiz later on here. Um, and also its behavior. So here at the top, I'm showing you the females. The males are at the bottom here. It has this uh, little face mark here. to distinct. That's one way you can tell it's a male. And that's true with a lot of bees. Um, the antenna tend to be a little curved, a little more straight than a honeybee. The um, hairs on the thorax, on the back, if you will, are more tawny than a honeybee. Um, the abdomen is striped. Now you'll get stripes on a honeybee, but these are much more, dis much, the, the stripes are much more clear and almost black and white. Um, and you want to pay attention to that because if you're looking down in a flower, a lot of times all you see is the abdomens because the, uh, they're in there nectaring and the striping pattern will give it away fairly quickly. Another thing that distinguishes this is the flight behavior. These, um, these bees will um, fly, fly right above the canopy fairly fast and then dart down into a, a flower fairly quickly. When they come out, you see that happening again, whereas a honeybee will tend to circle and, and slowly approach a flower compared to these uh, squash bees. Um, not some more pictures from uh, Katharina and some diagrams here from the literature, but um, you can see the bee nesting in the ground. You can see the nesting hole here, and this typically occurs in and around the squash planting itself or the cucurbita pumpkin planting. Um, and it's the, the the width is maybe the size of a pencil. Um, you can see they they make this little antechamber, which uh, might influence humidity processes further down. They'll dig down and they'll create these, these, these uh, areas where they tap, cap off and make a cell. Um, for those of you that are used to pest management, where I was coming from, 
Um, it's important to notice that the number of offspring per female, and this is true for a lot of our solitary bees, is, is really low compared to our pests. You know, we're talking eight, 10, we're lucky to see 30. I mean, there might be five or six or not much more than that cells per female in a good setting. She might make, um, I'm sorry, cells per, per, per a given nest. She might make several nests and you might up, get up into the 20s, maybe 30 offspring per female. That's a whole lot different than your herbaceous pests that are out there with 200, 1,000, 3,000 offspring per individual. Um, so when you're conserving these, you've got to think more, uh, more along the lines of uh, relatively uh, low fecundity. The distribution of um, the depth of the nest, and this again is from Katrina, uh, you can see that the majority of them were somewhere between um, five, and, 5 and 20 inches in the Central Valley of California. I suspect it's more shallow here where we have more shallow soils. Um, so this is the number of larvae and pupae from 10 different nests. So if you, when, when a crop is uh, ending and you're closing that crop off, uh, cleaning it up, how you manage that soil from that point in time all the way to the next July, mid-July that they're emerging, that's gonna influence the survivorship of those um, pre pupae So if you go in there and you're cleaning the crop up and you disc deeply, you're gonna cause a lot of mortality. If you disc very shallowly, like just a couple inches, uh, you will kill some, you'll get some surviving as well. Uh, if you can not disc it at all, uh, that's the best option, of course. Um, so in our area, one one reasonable thing that people have been doing is they uh, they clean it up, then they might do a, a, a very shallow uh, drilling in of, of say a wheat crop if they can get it in or some kind of cover crop. Um, so we're only going down a couple inches, and um, and then if it's a wheat crop, let it go all the way to the next um, summer, and and you haven't disturbed the soil at all. So your tillage practices are, are critical. And this gives you an example from some work by uh, Schuler and Ralston and his crew. Um, he was showing in, in this area of Virginia and Maryland from a bunch of different farms, farms either on that farmscape itself or the surrounding immediate landscape, if it had no till as a common practice, it had triple the rate of squash bee visitation the next year. Um, and in that case, they measured pesticide use, honeybee colony, colony rental, that had no influence on the results. So um, keeping that tillage to a, a reasonable minimum uh, really helps. Another thing to consider is your rotations from crop to crop. Of course, in our area, we're looking at uh, three, at least three, maybe four year rotations before you would put a cucurbita crop behind, behind another cucurbita crop. So they're getting moved around in the farmscape and the landscape. Um, if you're keeping your field, say, within a mile, uh, the bees seem to do a pretty decent job of, of finding that, uh, that new plot. Um, if you're farther than that, you run into some problems. And of course, if you're in some settings where you're just rotating within a farm, um, the bees are doing a good job finding the new plots. So um, I want to turn now to Bumblebees, as I mentioned earlier, there were seven species that we saw in our farmscapes and uh, as we were doing this work around pumpkin fields, but the phenology of those different species vary and by, for, for whatever reason, by the time we were looking at open pumpkin flowers, in our case, uh, last week of July or sometimes mid-July on up through August and um, sometimes even early September, um, we were basically looking at the common eastern bumblebee, which is Bombus impatiens. So these, the biology of these is that um, they overwinter as queens, as solitary queens uh, is where they start from. And they start emerging and establishing nests in our area as early as March 20th. So when woodland flowers, daffodils are blooming, that's when you want to look for queens. Um, they really can do a really good job. Uh, people up in New York, Arts and his studies have shown that they deposit three times more pollen per visit than honeybees. 
They contact the stigma more often. Uh, fewer visits are required for pollination than the other two species. Of course, they're well known for being active on cloudy days, on cool days, and they are available commercially. They have an interesting life cycle. It's uh, primitively eusocial, so it really transitions within a given year from a, almost a solitary life cycle to a social life cycle and then back to a solitary life cycle. So you have to think about that if you're thinking about the resources needed for these, for these uh, insects, for these bumblebees, the ones that are wild out, out in your la landscape. Um, in this case, I'm just going to show you a diagram and then some other details. She's starting as an overwintered queen. She, she nests in sheltered locations. Uh, I don't believe they're good at digging uh, nests very well, but they can find sheltered locations. Maybe they do some digging. Um, and in the spring, they uh, establish their, their nest and they have to create a, a, a waxen pot, kind of diagrammed here, um, which takes a lot of resources and they have to provision that with honey. Uh, so there, this is the queen foraging. Those resources have to be there that early in the year for her to be able to uh, provision this with honey, which she's going to need in, in, by the, uh, as we go through these slides. She starts laying eggs in individual um, waxen containers, so they're making all of those resources. And the brood develops. And while this brood is developing, she doesn't do a lot of foraging. So she's relying on what she's had, what she can store up in this period of time. It reminds me somewhat of a, of a, of a bird trying to roost on, on a mass of eggs. Um, and, man, and if she can manage to get far enough so that uh, offspring start emerging, which we're over here now, now she has offspring and the, the female offspring become workers. So we're into this time frame here where now we have a uh, a social life cycle going on where we have division of labor, the queen's still laying eggs, uh, but the workers now are out uh, provisioning uh, for, for uh, pollen and nectar. And then we're going to get into this competition point, which I'll address later. And then the um, coming out of that would be males and females mating, and the, ma the females will overwinter again as individual uh, queens. Think about this this time frame here. It's the competition point. This, so we're, the colony will grow to about 100 to 200 workers. Here you're looking down in a colony. Uh, the colors here have been added. To the, these are marked honey bee, uh, bumblebees. But you can see it's not as organized as a honeybee colony, but you have these uh, individual cells with brood in them, individual cells with, with honey, uh, with nectar in them. Uh, the colony will grow for 100 to 200 workers, maybe more. This switch point starts, some people have defined it as a switch point or competition point where the queen starts laying male, which are unfertilized eggs. Um, the, the queen destined larvae develop. The workers now will activate their ovaries uh, and lay unfertilized eggs, and you get this worker worker competition, worker queen competition fighting between the individuals, um, eating of eggs, <laughs> the, the queen will eat the worker's eggs, the workers might eat the queen, the queen eggs. So we've got um, uh, a revolution going on here. Uh, and as this happens, then new queens emerge, males emerge, then we have this mating and this overwintering occurring. So as I mentioned back here, it's a Starts as a solitary life cycle, goes through a social life cycle, and then back to a solitary life cycle. Um, in the, the number of colonies in our area has been amazing. Uh, a lot of times we try and evaluate the, the, uh, the health of the bee populations, multiple species, for pollination by looking at visitation rates on flowers. And in the case of Pepinapus, the squash bee, you're looking at each individual being a, a single individual. Um, in the case of bumblebees, it's, it's useful to try and figure out how many colonies you have going on. I mean, there's, if, you, if you saw a hundred times you saw a bumblebee visiting a pumpkin flower, was that a hundred individuals from a hundred different colonies? And the colony is the reproductive unit. Or was that 100 individuals from one colony, which would not be nearly as robust? So we've been able to, um, and this is under the leadership of uh, 
Jamie Strange at the uh, Logan Lab, USDA ARS Log uh, B Lab in Logan, Utah, following his uh, advice and protocols. Uh, Carly uh, Miller, a student here, has been using DNA to estimate um, SIP ships. Uh, how many, how many uh, sisterhoods do we have uh, from collections of bees? So here's a collection of 200 bees. Extract the DNA, do the magic, and, and create an estimate of how many colonies that represented. And in, in summary right here, you can see we're getting over 100 colonies per field multiple times in multiple um, counties and and fields. So we've got some really strong uh, populations of the common eastern bumblebee in Pennsylvania. And so I keep stressing to growers, and I think there's a lot of, seeing a lot of interest in conserving these bumblebees. And I just wanted to point to this resource uh, from, from Xerces, which gives you, it's about a 30 page booklet, free PDF download, and gives you a real good uh, summary of things to think about and how to conserve the bumblebees in your farmscape and landscape. When we're talking about conserving bees, this is true for all bees, we're talking about providing nutrition and shelter, um, minimizing stress from pathogens, parasites, or, or pesticides. And I often get asked, well, where? Where do you do this? Um, remember that these are central place foragers. They are they're coming back to a nest. Uh, small bees might forage fairly close to the hive. A half mile less is not uncommon. Larger bees can fly much farther, and people have recorded several miles, eight miles. But in general, it really depends on the available resources. Uh, bees will take advantage of the resources that are nearby, uh, sometimes not flying very far at all if, if, if the resources are, are right there. And more recent statistical uh, evaluations of land use. Uh, there's several papers that are showing that um, high quality land use at the local scale, the farmscape scale, they're calling roughly less than 500 meters, have been more correlated to rates of visitation on crops than uh, measures farther out, which I find encouraging. It suggests that what you do on your farmscape can uh, help conserve the bees in that area. Um, Floral provisioning is often used as a way to provide the nutrition, um, which is great. In the case of the squash bees, the nutrition is the cucurbita crop itself. They're dependent on, on the squash pollen. But in the case of bumblebees, there's many, many options. Um, they need a season-long diet from that time when the early March all the way to October in the case of uh, East common eastern bumblebee in the northeast here. There's a lot of herbs that work really well. Um, woody vines, um, uh, this clematis here, which is in my backyard, gets lots and lots of bees on it in, in August and September. We see them visiting uh, trees, native perennials, which is putting out meadows of um, herbaceous plants that, that help conserve bees, that's popular. And cover cropping uh, is, is also an option. Uh, we've been playing around with uh, cover cropping. The, um, here's some examples for native meadows. Um, there's many species that uh, bumblebees will visit. Here's ones that are getting some of the highest visitation rates in our landscape. Uh, bee balm is a, is a good one in the herbaceous meadows that have been planted. Sometimes this, after four, five, six years, uh, this becomes more predominant. One thing I will note, if we get into the pumpkin field itself or adjacent to it, these, uh, the common eastern bumblebee at least takes, makes some strong choices. The plants are competing for the pollinators. Um, thistle and nightshade weeds, for example, will totally outcompete pumpkin flowers. So I've seen this competition fairly strongly. To give you an example, um, I would go out and visit a pumpkin field with the intent of collecting 200 visitors off the pumpkin flower, that was the protocol, which I was going to uh, preserve and get the DNA from to estimate how many colonies there are. And in our landscape, we usually go out with two people and get it done in a single day. It's, it, uh, I don't think that can be done in all locations, but that's about the average that we've been, we've been achieving. Sometimes we have to come back a second day if it's a cloudy day or whatever. But I've been in fields where I'm out there uh, with the intent on getting the job done in one day or two days, 
and there's lots of bumblebees, and I can't collect a single one. And that's because um, nightshade is flowering uh, just in patches, uh, but it's in full flower. Um, I have to wait for the nightshade to uh, senesce, and once that happens, then I get my visitation rates on the pumpkin flowers. So there is that plant, plants competing for the pollinators. Um, what we've started to try and do is use this, we call it targeted floral provisioning. So we're, um, we, we tried this effort with cover crops uh, in large part because at the time we were working with growers that were um, large scale uh, wholesale retail operations. So they, they, uh, they had larger fields that they were um, moving about um, 20, 30, 40 miles apart. And so we couldn't put herbaceous meadows adjacent to a field, but we could put cover crops right in that field, uh, either uh, early or late. And mass flowering, these cover crops provide a big pulse of mass flowers, you know, a lot of resources all at once. Um, so we aim this at early and late stages of the common eastern bumblebee. Um, this sort of gives you a, a, a picture of what we were aiming at. We were trying to get a fall planted cover crop that would overwinter and flower in the spring um, so that it was present here when the overwintered queen was trying to establish her nest and establish her first, uh, first maybe or beginning of the second brood. We were less concerned about what was happening in this time period in June and, and early July because the landscape is supporting more wild things. Uh, but, but mostly because we're trying to get the bees to take advantage of the pumpkin flowers, which is occurring about in here in our landscape. And then we had a summer planted, something that we plant right about in here, such that there are flowers right about in here, thinking that we were hopefully providing resources for the new queen, either directly or indirectly. Uh, so that's the idea of targeting this. And, and we did it with these uh, cover crop mixes, these cover crop cocktails, they call it in this area, uh, in hopes of um, providing a pulse, but a pulse that would occupy six to eight weeks and also one that um, gave you a little bit more diversity than, than a single species. Um, there are several studies suggesting that a diverse diet is, is important for, for these species. So the the fall planted spring flowering thing, this is what we used oats. As, we shifted from common practice of people here using rye, shit went to oats because that provided a nurse crop so that things could start establishing in the fall, but it would winter kill. And as it, after winter killed, these other species would flower, the canola, crimson clover, purple bounty, hairy vetch. We went, we went with purple bounty because we got about a week, 10 days earlier bloom. Um, this is what we got. We used buckwheat, mustard, sunflower, sun hemp, and cow peas. We pulled out of the mixture because it wasn't competitive. Um, but we would do that and we would get uh, a, you know, a, a planting aimed at July 4th to July 10th, and we would get the flowers uh, available to the bees after the pumpkin crop was kind of cutting out. So with the, cro with the cocktail option, we were achieving, you know, with just a single narrow strip, you know, eight foot wide, whatever the drill width was for the grower, and, and these growers commonly had grain drills on their farms. You could put a single single narrow strip alongside a field. Here's the pumpkin field over here. And as this is cutting out, this is flowering in here, and you get this succession of blooms. Picked up some feeding by monarchs even through as well, some nectaring there. So um, there's a lot of uh, good resources about cover cropping. Um, and here's a few. Here's some um, ones from Xerces that are specifically directed for cover crops for pollinators. And it's one of many ways to achieve um, nutritional resources for bees in your farmscape. Okay, so uh, how am I doing on time? I'm, doing, I'm, I'm gonna move along here a little bit quickly. But for those of you that have been watching, uh, three species of bees, right? And you can tell them apart. Oops, let me back up. I think this will work. Um, oh, I probably have to do it over here. Yeah. So as you watch this, this was from an extension educator in, in Pennsylvania, Tanner Del Val, and he's going to first show you which species of bee, well, there's a cheat sheet. <laughs> so there's your honeybee. Notice the striping is there, but it's not very distinct. These are your uh, striped cucumber beetles over here. Um, notice she's going right after the nectar. Um, 
There's her tongue going out. And if you get a chance, you might get a chance to see her antenna there. They're elbowed. Um, so there's, there's the picture of the honeybee, not bothered at all by this pest species, which is a whole other story. Um, she wasn't collecting pollen. And here's the squash bee. And notice, you've, notice how strong the striping is. The antenna are not as elbowed. She's actually doing a lot of grooming there and um, packing the pollen on her corbicula. You know, she's grooming uh, herself and, and she'll keep that pollen. Um, I'm hoping you're going to get a, a shot of the abdomen. Uh, there's, a, there's a good shot of the more tawny um, uh, hairs on the back compared to the honeybee. And I hope at the very beginning, you, here you can see from the side, um, a more distinctive striping. Uh, again, in the sunlight, it's almost black and white. And our last uh, star here is the bumblebee. Um, larger, bumbles are in there. Um, common eastern bumblebee in this case. And again, you can see f focusing on the nectar, very much focusing on the nectar. So pretty easy to tell apart once you get used to them. Um, okay. Okay, let's see, I need to, uh, how do I advance this? Okay, so we got a pretty good sense of the idea of integrating the pollinators into the system and a little bit about horticultural practices, rotation, things like that. Um, most of you, I think, are familiar with the idea of integrated pest management, IPM. You try and avoid problems by how you organize your your farm, you sample for pests, you use chemicals when necessary or other kinds of tactics uh, to, to keep pests below uh, thresholds that are, that are uh, necessary, economic thresholds. Um, and it's kind of obvious now that we've always been trying to preserve beneficials in this system. And so we've got this integrated crop pollination uh, concept here and we just put, some people are now calling it IPPM, Integrated Pest and Pollinator Management. And I want to transition to a little bit of, of that discussion. Before I do though, I want to keep in mind one more factor that's really critical when we think about pest management and preserving these pollinators. Uh, we got to think about the, the brains of bees. Bees need to, um, bumblebees in this example, all bees uh, need to learn and memorize locations of home and foraging. And this, I'm going to show you a few, a, a few small videos from um, this study here where um, they, they posted these videos online um, just to give you an idea of how, how important this learning process is. So we're going to look at a single bee from a, uh, I think this is Bombus terrestris, and um, so it's a bumblebee from a commercial nest. The nest is right here. So in this case, each cell is 10, to, 10 by 10 meters. We're looking at about three, three and a half acres, a 10 minute flight in the afternoon. Watch the bee, young bee, uh, day one out of the nest, and she's poking around, doesn't go very far. Um, it's taken 10 minutes to orient herself pretty much and get back to the nest. Now let's look at a, um, now we're looking at 63 acres, much larger area. This bee is, um, I think a three, three day old bee and watch her flight in, uh, in about one hour's time. She's covering a lot larger area and she's going to, looks like she's got some directed flight. Looks like she knows where she's going. It's taken a while to do it. She's, this is uh, 66 minutes. But there you can see a bee that um, knows, wh knows where she's going and knows how to get home. And uh, now let's go to uh, a, a trip six, six day old bee, same, same bee. They had them individually marked. Much smaller area now. Well, larger than the first case, was smaller than the second that I showed you, 14 acres, a 20 minute flight. Um, and she heads out, and in a pretty quick period of time, 
she goes right out to where she needs to go and goes right back. Um, the thing that I wanted you to get from, from watching those little clips is uh, the trip one, we, there was less experience sticking closer to the nest, orienting to lands, landmarks. There really was no foraging going on, uh, no, no pollen or nectar uh, coming back. Uh, uh, later, we had straighter paths, longer flights, foraging was happening. By trip six, there was very directed flights, foraging was happening. So bees have brains and their learning and memory um, rivals that as what you might find in tests with rats or mice. Um, so now we have to talk about pesticide issues. Obviously, we're not going to want to kill bees, but we have the issue in cucurbits where um, sublethal concentrations are affecting a variety of things, including learning and memory. Now, and I was advised not to get into the neonicotinoid uh, debate, but um, I'm going to dive right, right in. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to talking to growers about the issues that they can deal with uh, that are most important. Now, the neonics, um, we're dealing with insects and disease. I think, let me jump to the next slide. If you think about, here's your pollinators up here, you look at your pests, which I've shown here. I mean, striped cucumber beetle vectors a bacterial pathogen. Um, squash bug vectors a different bacterial pathogen. Our aphids are vectoring viruses. We have some other relatives of this species, other diabrotica beetles that are vectoring viruses. Um, the pests cause direct problems, and because of the vectoring issues, you can't tolerate very much of these pests. And so we typically have systemics in production. It varies to the, the degree to which that happens in different parts of the US, depending on when these pests are moving in. Um, Neonix replaced other systemics that were out there. Uh, they replaced in our area carbofuran, and you can look at the uh, cute oral LD50. You see a dramatic tenfold uh, I guess more than ten, much more than tenfold uh, uh, reduction in in farm worker. Uh, in, I'm sorry, much more uh, improvement in farm worker safety. A 30 to 50 fold improvement in farm worker safety measured by these kinds of metrics. And in fact, I was one of the people that helped do the research to make imidacloprid a, a replacement for carbofuran, and I'm I'm glad I did. So that's used early in the season in our geographic area to prevent this beetle from transmitting these bacterial cells, which are you see now in, inside a xylem vessel, which causes this bacterial wilt. Um, but the, the problem is that we need to kind of minimize that, um, and, and I'll talk about that in a, in, in, in a couple different slides. We also need to um, spray only after the blooms close, we've got this, it's, it's a wonderful advantage of this crop is the blooms will close by midday or one o'clock at the latest. Uh, if you don't spray when the blooms are open, like you see here, limit your sprays to when the blooms are not present or closed. Uh, at least you have that period of time for the non-systemics to dry and thus become um, less of a problem for bees that are doing a good job of only entering flowers and not landing on the, the dried residues. And, and by the way, I should mention, if you do that also with fungicides that might be applied late, uh, that's also a good conservation measure. Getting back to the, the neonics, um, you know, five to 10 parts per billion tends to be sufficient for pest control. These are very uh, effective materials, much more effective, than 10,000 times more effective than DDT. There's a lot of different ways to apply the neonics. If you limit, if you keep the application so that it's very early, um, we get much less residue. There's several studies that have shown that if you um, limit a neonic application to a seed treatment and nothing else, you, you're on detectable levels by the time you get into the pollen and nectar. If you apply later, if you do soil drenches, foliar applications, there are residues that show up in pollen and nectar, higher in pollen than in nectar. I'm only aware of a couple studies, uh, so I don't think there's a real good understanding of, of how to manage the crop to keep those residue levels low. But what I've been telling growers in our area is uh, don't use neonics after a seed treatment. Um, and that tends to work in the pumpkin crop because it's direct seeded. It's uh, more of a problem if we have transplanted crops um, and, and that's, that's another issue. 
Um, try and work with your neighbors to affect neonics at the at, at a larger scale. The um, the amount of neonics that are, are going into the environment has risen dramatically, and um, in places where it's really not necessary, like soybean. Um, so be aware of after and whether there was neonics applied to that crop, and um, maybe not put neonics in, in some areas such as soybean crops, which in our area is really not necessary. I, I wanted to stress this because even though I told you that we had really good populations of Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, it doesn't mean that bumblebees are doing great all over the world. Here's, here's um, seven species, I'm counting this right, three, four, five, six, seven, seven species of Bombus and their relatives that are, um, that are in decline. And, and there's one that uh, really belongs on the endangered species list. We don't always know why these declines are occurring, um, but I, all, I, all I've been telling growers is, look, you've got, in our area, you've got great wild bee populations. We don't know um, why exactly they're doing great. Um, the stressors that are out there that are affecting bees, let's keep those stressors down and conserve what we've got because they're doing the job. Another thing you can do is if you need an aphicide in pumpkins, we have selective options um, that um, basically work on the subarial pump, the part of the head of the aphid that is used to pump up uh, the uh, sap from the, from the plant. And um, so you can kind of deal with your aphids without affecting uh, a lot of your other species out there. So uh, I think I've, talk right along without giving you folks much of a break. And, uh, and so I need to ask uh, Katharina, are there some questions we can deal with? And I just wanted to bring the major point home is that conserving wild bees along with honeybees really helps get the job done. Thanks uh, so much, Shelby, for such a great and informative um, presentation. We do have a couple of questions, and for those who have yet to ask questions, um, feel free to do that uh, in the Q&A box. Um, just to answer one thing quickly, the presentation will be available uh, both online and then sent in an email to registrants. So to hop into questions, we have um, Doreen is asking about vetch in the use of the cover crop for bees and asking if it becomes a weedy species um, the next year, if you've had any problem with it becoming uh, persistent in the um, soil. Yeah, the question is vetch becoming weedy. I, I would say that no, we have not had a problem with that, but we do with uh, buckwheat. We've used buckwheat. And so when we talk to growers about that, some growers are comfortable with letting buckwheat go to flower and it goes from flower to seed really, really quick. Um, and based on their rotations, they're okay with that. Uh, some try and keep buckwheat out of the system. We've not had a problem with vetch. Um, it, we, it, it, in our area, it's very common to use rye as a, we're almost uh, 40, 60% of the growers are using rye as a cover crop, no-till cover crop. And so from doing a rye vetch mix uh, to also including just a strip of vetch, they're pretty comfortable with that. I've not heard it uh, as a problem. Um, I will say that uh, the, we've been trying to get early cultivars of vetch and the cover crop, the breeding of cover crops has not progressed as fast as the breeding of crops, but there are some really good studies and efforts now to do cover breeding and um, with cover crops and I've been trying to stress the idea of getting that earliness so I can provide resources for that uh, overwintered queen. And it, it sounds like then too, with the, in terms of the recommendations about managing those flowering cover crops, if you can let them flower, but then um, disc them under before they really set seed, if there's enough time to do that, is that the general recommendation to try and avoid the weed issue? Yes, yes, that would be it exactly. Buckwheat, that's hard to do. Um, I think in with some growers I've worked with, they've just, um, killed off the cover crop. It, it, they've let it flower, but then kill it off in time to uh, avoid the seed set, but um, left the strip, left just a you know six foot wide strip and just let that run wild for another few weeks and it doesn't seem to trouble them too much. And that's provided a 
floral resource. Great. So we have um, two questions from Olivia. Olivario, um, hopefully I said your name okay. Um, the first question is, how can we provide nesting sites for squash bees or pibonapis? And the other question is, is there only one season of flowering of cucurbita in the USA, or is it flowering multiple times across the season? You know, I'm going to take the second question, the idea of um, what's the sequence of flowering of cucurbita. Um, it really depends an awful lot on the horticultural system that you're in. So we have people that are um, fresh market direct retail. So they're growing their pumpkin crops and they're aiming for uh, selling some at a farm stand, distributing some, and then having a pumpkin festival with thousands of people showing up. They're growing cultivars that are relatively indeterminate. They will give it some nutrients and water through time and they'll put a succession of cultivars out there. So they get flowering and fruit set for eight, nine weeks, 10 weeks sometimes. On the other hand, we have people that are, that are managing for wholesale, like uh, trucking it to Walmart and grocery stores. Um, they have a higher plant population, pump the nutrients in quicker, get their fruit set, try and push that fruit set really high, as, as, as high as they can, um, because then the crop will cut out, if you will. They go with cultivars that tend not to, you know, have, have a bit more determinant. I don't think we have totally determinant cucurbitus species in our, in our uh, arsenal right now. So we get some flowering later, but relatively minimal. Um, then we have farmscapes that are doing squash and they're picking squash and then they also have cucurbita. So there we have cucurbita throughout the season. And I think, um, I don't know, Katharina, do you want to comment on, on in, your, in your setting with hybrid squash? Yeah, I guess I can add in, um, in California where I'm ba based, a lot of the growers that are growing squash or pumpkin, uh, a few are growing for, um, you know, the Halloween season here in, in the U.S., but um, uh, a number of the conventional growers are growing uh, for hybrid seed production. And in that case, you do get um, like a succession of bloom throughout the season, but not as much um, as you do in uh, um, fresh market uh, summer squash production systems where you have growers um, planting squash in succession throughout the entire season so they can harvest the entire season long. So there's some, I guess, I guess maybe the, the point is that there's some regions of the U.S. where you have a, a really contracted bloom period depending on what market they're growing for and other regions where you might get bloom throughout the entire season uh, if they're growing, for example, for fresh market summer squash production. Does that sound about right, Shelby? Yeah, I think that does sound right. And you can see you're going to need to tailor both your pest and pollinator management for these different systems. Um, and I could go on about that for with with the pest part as well. But let, shifting to her, the first question that was asked about how to uh, encourage nesting, I, I think that's um, one of the cutting edge areas of research for this uh, for this animal. There's there are some studies, including Katharina's study. Um, I I think the uh, having some d disturbed soil around the field near the edges in the field itself becomes important. We also have plastic culture here where we have um, people growing, you know, on, on uh, raised beds with plastic mulch. And um, they will nest in underneath that, uh, but they won't do it as well as if you had some um, disturbed soil. If there's no-till production, I think we're encouraging nesting. But beyond that, I'm going to ask Katharina to tell us what she saw in the Central Valley. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think at this point, there's no um, management practice that we can recommend to growers um, as we do, for example, uh, growers trying to manage beds of alkali bee for um, alkali bees for um, or leaf cutter bees for alfalfa seed production. Um, we can't say amend the soil in this way and you'll get um, uh, these bees nesting. Um, instead, I, I think um, exactly what Shelby said about um, keeping some areas free of tillage 
um, where the bees can nest can be important. And um, also continuing to maintain some kind of squash bloom in your, uh, uh, on your farm from year to year uh, is also important. Um, we have, we do have one more question and I just want to say um, because of the time, I think we're going to have to answer it offline. So Sabod, we see your question. We'll add it to um, the email that we send out to all the registrants and answer it there. Um, uh, but because we're a little bit over the hour, um, I think we need to wrap things up. Shelby, thank you so much for uh, such a great presentation with, with so much information. Um, it was really great to have you here and really great to have everyone online. Uh, two things are gonna happen right now. Um, uh, Mark is going to launch a poll uh, for uh, you all to give us a sense of, of what you thought about the webinar. I'm also going to put a link into the chat box. This will bring you to a Google form that you can fill out if you are looking for certified crop advisor credits. So take a few minutes, please, or seconds to uh, answer this quick poll. And if you're looking for CCA credits, uh, please go to the Google form link in the chat box. Um, and just one more reminder, um, we have one last webinar in the series that will be focused on um, uh, um, uh, blue orchard bee production for almond. So if that's something you're interested in, join us for that. Teresa Pitzinger from the USDA will be leading that webinar and uh, will be capping off the whole webinar series for us. Thank you, Shelby, so much for, for your presentation. Thanks for Mark for, for hosting and to eExtension for allowing us to present this webinar here. And then thanks to all of you uh, for joining us from around the country and around the world. And look out for an email from us in the next week or so. It will include a link to the YouTube um, uh, site where the recording of this presentation will be posted and will also include uh, slides and answer any questions that we didn't get to answer as part of this presentation. We'll, we'll uh, stay online for another uh, minute or so in case you want to put any more questions into the Q&A box or chat box, but thanks to everyone for, for joining us and have a great day. And thanks again, Shelby. Thank you.